All right, so let's tie in like why we're talking about electromagnetic radiation and calculating energy and frequency for light and all this stuff. And let's tie it into chemistry and the atom. Okay, so our good buddy Bohr, he pretty much devoted his life and work to this hydrogen atom and figuring out what was going on inside of this hydrogen atom and any other one electron species. And he did some fantastic work, but what we came to learn, tying in with this whole you know, packets of energy, photons, is that when the electrons would transition in an atom, okay, they would absorb a certain amount of energy, and if, the, if they traveled to an energy level that was higher, or they would release energy as they travel to lower energy levels. And so as electrons would transition downward to lower energy levels, they would release these packets of light, and sometimes we would see them visibly, and those would be our atomic emission spectrums. So here are the electron transitions for the hydrogen atom. Um, on the left you see, like, if a hydrogen, if the electron went from higher energy levels all the way down to energy level 1, the ground state, well then we would end up having what we see here called the Lyman series. And those are very large energy transitions, and those are actually in the ultraviolet region. If we look here, if the electron comes from a higher energy level and lands at energy level 2, this is the atomic emission spectrum that we see for hydrogen, the Balmer series. There's a very distinct red, green, blue, and purple line on the atomic emission spectrum for hydrogen. If the electron only transitions down to the third energy level, then it's the passion series, and those are in the infrared region because, again, we're not as big of an energy shift, so less energy associated with those transitions. And then we even see, going to energy level four, the bracket series. All right, so, and so this, again, starts giving us some insight into the structure of the atom. We don't just have electrons in a you know, floating around anywhere, they seem to be on distinct energy levels. And so we make a huge assumption. In fact, in the Rene packet, she calls it the mother of all assumptions. That's where I am in the middle of page 5. So it says, an electron with n equals 1 has the most negative energy and is thus the most strongly attracted to the positive nucleus. Okay, and so what that means is, when you're on energy level 1, the energy that's closest to the nucleus, as a negative electron, you would have the strongest attraction to the positive nucleus. We give that energy a negative value because if we send energy into the atom that would have to be absorbed by that electron, the energy going in would be a positive energy value. Kind of like heat going into the system for an endothermic reaction is a positive value. And so what we start talking a little bit about here, and we're going to use this over and over and over again, is Coulomb's Law. Okay, the force of attraction between two particles is proportional to the charge of each particle multiplied together, Q1 times Q2, divided by the distance between the particles, R squared. And so let's just say for a hydrogen atom, and there's a proton with plus one charge, neutron, negative one charge, so that would be negative one, divided by the distance between them. So if you are on energy level one and closest to the nucleus, that would be the largest force of attraction. If you move to energy level two, okay, the distance is greater, we square that distance, so we divide by that distance squared, so we would have that much less force of attraction etc etc and this is going to help explain our periodic trends it's going to help explain the melting points of ionic compounds you know the higher the charges we can have a greater sense of attraction and it's going to be harder to break them apart etc etc so keep coulomb's law in mind for a while all right so again we give some mad props to mr bohr because his work really did give us a lot of insight into what was going on in the atom. And like I said, his calculations were super fantastic for our one electron systems. Hydrogen, a helium plus one ion, lithium plus two ions. Not 
as popular to talk about. But now, again, there's not going to be a Bohr equation calculation on the AP exam, I don't believe. Um, but it is a big part of a lot of first year college chemistry courses. So at least it's kind of like a rite of passage to do a couple energy calculations involving the Bohr equation. And so here you see the, the equation, negative 2.178 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. That's just like a slew of concerts, concerts, sorry, <laughs> constants together. Um, Planck's constant, the speed of light, this Ryberg's constant, I believe. Again, Renee can tell you a little more. You can Google it or just accept it as fact that this is the Bohr equation. Z stands for the nuclear charge. Okay, so again, we're going to stick to hydrogen, so we're going to stick to Z equal, equaling 1. And then N would be the energy level. So we see here, calculate the energy required to excite the hydrogen electron from level N equals 1 to N equals 2. And then calculate the wavelength of light that must be absorbed by the hydrogen atom in its ground state for this to happen. So what would the wavelength of that light be to get that electron to jump from 1 to 2? So we can use that equation and say, all right, so on energy level 1, there's this much energy. Again, the equation looks way more intimidating than the actual calculation. So I use my constant, my slew of constants, and then I've got Z is 1, the nuclear charge of 1, N is 1, so that's all 1. So there's the energy on uh, energy level 1. Energy level 2, the only thing that changes is now N is 2. So I take my slew of constant times one-fourth, and there's my energy. And so to figure out how much energy is the difference, you just delta E it, subtract. All right, And you see it's 1.633 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. This is a positive energy value because that energy would have to be absorbed by that electron to get it to jump from 1 to 2. All right. So that's part of it, but again, they want us to also calculate the wavelength. And so, of course, we know that the wavelength, E equals the Planck's constant times frequency, which frequency is C over lambda. And then to find lambda wavelength, we just have to do Planck's times the speed of light divided by the energy. Yay, school's over. <laughs> And so there, plug and chug, and we see the wavelength associated with that electron transition. So that's one type of Bohr equation calculation you might encounter. You're going to see one on your unit exam, just because, like I said, rite of passage. But I'll give you the equation and whatnot. But here it says, calculate the energy required to remove the electron. So going from the ground state, n equals 1, to n equals infinity. And so we can just kind of rearrange the Bohr equation and just show it as delta E. So we can see our constant there, negative 2.178 times 10 to the negative 18th. And then, again, the 1 on the top, that's Z. We're talking about hydrogen, so it's 1. And then we can have the energy level final minus the energy level initial there. So we're going, again, from 1 to infinity, so it would kind of look like that. And my math people, 1 over infinity, infinity's kind of a big number, that's essentially 0. So, again, to remove an electron from a hydrogen atom, that, and it's in its ground state, it would take that much energy to be absorbed. All right. And again, positive value, that's how much it would take to get that electron out. Now, if you're trying to figure out how much it would take to get from the second energy level out, then this would be... 1 over 4 over here, so it would be 1 fourth times the constant. To get it from the third energy out, or third energy level out, it would be times 1 ninth. So again, the farther away the electron gets from the nucleus, it's, there's less of a coulombic force of attraction, and so it takes less energy to get it out. All right. So the, the rest here, again, you know, once... The, I mean, Bohr's stuff worked great for a single electron system. 
we have elements that have more than that. So Schrodinger came in, and while Bohr was focusing on the electron as a particle, Schrodinger said, hey, let's look at it as a wave. Um, Heisenberg and Born came in and gave us this uncertainty principle and said, yeah, when you've got all those electrons, there's no way you're going to be able to find exactly where the electron is and how it's moving and how much energy it has, etc. You're going to be able to figure out a very high likelihood probability of where you would find the electron but not exactly you can't know every single thing about a moving electron in that atom and then through some complex calculus and differential equations you can solve Schroden Schrodinger's wave functions and the solutions to these complex math problems end up being our orbitals and quantum numbers that we'll talk about and electron configurations and so that's where this all comes from this lovely field of quantum mechanics but again don't freak out um, if you're taking chemistry in college and going further in this subject that's like your third chemistry class you take your general chem which is what we're doing now then organic chemistry and then p-chem physical chem and by the time you get there you should have plenty of calculus and differential equations under your belt so you can kind of understand <laughs> what the solving of those equations look like fortunately for you you live in an exciting time where we now have the technology that backs up this mathematical theory and we're going to be looking at that with photoelectron spectroscopy so that is pretty darn cool alright peace out See you soon.